Hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, Cyber Policy Center uh, seminar. Uh, my name is Jeff Hancock. I am co-director here at the Cyber Policy Center along with Nate. And I'm really excited today to introduce one of my colleagues in the Department of Communication, uh, Professor Jen Pan. I'm going to keep it relatively short because I can say it fairly quickly. Jen is perhaps the leading expert in thinking about um, not only how uh, authoritarian governments use technology, which is one of the, the best thinkers about polarization, disagreement, and some of the things that she's going to discuss today. She's a wonderful uh, colleague, and I'm so glad that she's here sharing her research with us at CBC. Please uh, welcome Jen with me. Thanks so much, Jen. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jeff, for that wonderful introduction. It's great to be here. So today I'm going to talk to you about partisan conflict over content moderation as being more than about disagreement over facts. So this is joint work with Ruth Apple and Molly Roberts. This project's motivation comes from the fact that as misinformation has gained more public attention and as there are more calls and pressures on social media platforms to remove content from their platforms, we've seen this really deep partisan divide about whether content should be removed and what content should be removed. There's a large and growing literature on content moderation and this partisan divide and partisan differences is well documented. Uh, but the prevailing explanation for why there's this disagreement is what we call the fact gap. So this is the idea that Democrats and Republicans in the United States disagree about what constitutes misinformation. And if maybe we go a layer deeper, it's the idea that partisanship hinders people's ability to identify politically aligned content as being misinformation. There may be other reasons. Whatever the reasons, at the end of the day, this idea is that people can't agree on what's misinformation, and so that's why there's this disagreement about what should be removed. So in this paper, we theorize that there are additional sources of partisan disagreement over content removal. And we, uh, we focus on party promotion, what we call party promotion, and what we call the preference gap. So party promotion is this desire to leave misinformation online when it benefits your own party and denigrates the other party, and only remove that misinformation if it denigrates your own party and promotes the other party. So unlike the fact gap, which has some uh, linkage to your beliefs, this is strategic behavior. It's about strategically advantaging your side over the other side. Okay. So then the preference gap is about differences in internalized preferences over whether content should be removed and what should be removed. So we're back to preferences now. And unlike the fact gap, it's not about your beliefs of what's true or false. It's about your beliefs over whether things should be removed from online spaces or not. And I just want to emphasize that this preference gap can come from two pretty different sources, at least two pretty different sources. So on one hand, this preference gap could be really deeply rooted in core values. Uh, so one example would be people at a very young age have developed a set of core values. Because of those values, these people select into different political parties, and so their preferences that align with those parties are because of these deep-rooted uh, values. That means these preferences are very difficult to change. Another explanation for the preference gap is something that is potentially more changeable, which is that people are internalizing preferences based on elite cues and signals. So you have a person, their attention is captured by what their party elites are saying, and they believe, and they adopt those same preferences as a result. So you might Im imagine that this, if it's because of this elite signaling, these, this preference gap may be more changeable over time. All right. Uh, so what we do to examine these two factors is conduct an experiment in a nationally representative survey that was commissioned by the Knight Foundation and fielded by Ipsos in the summer of 2021. This has, our sample has about 1,000 respondents, and this is only respondents who are partisan. So Democrat, Democratic leaners, Republican, Republican leaners. There's no independence here because the theory is about partisanship. Uh, we try to control for the fact gap and disaggregate 
the effects of the preference gap in party promotion. So how do we try to control for the fat gap? First thing we do is in the design of the experiment, we tell respondents that all the headlines we show them are false. We say this headline has been established as false by third party fact checkers. And then in the analysis, we conduct three tests to try to separate out the fact gap. So we subset to respondents who agree that the headlines are, are inaccurate. We test only on consensus headlines where Democrats and Republicans rate these headlines as similarly inaccurate. And then we conduct a mediation analysis to look at whether if we take out the uh, accuracy, perception of accuracy as a mediator, is there still a direct effect on the outcomes that we're interested in. And we also conduct sensitivity analysis for the mediation analysis, given some strong assumptions they have to make for mediation. So this is the experimental design. We have our respondents. We first begin by asking them about their social media usage. Then they're shown two headlines. I'll get into that in a moment. And after the headlines, we ask them about three outcomes, which we call removal, harm, and censorship. And we also ask them about their perception of the accuracy of the headline. And we randomize the order, whether we ask them about the outcomes first or the accuracy first because we don't want to, we wanted to see whether there was an accuracy nudge or something like that, okay. And then at the, after we show them the two headlines and collect our outcomes, we then collect information about demographics, partisanship, political interests, et cetera. So this is an example of our treatment. So every respondent sees two headlines, one that is aligned with their partisanship and one that is misaligned with their partisanship. So let's say I'm a Republican respondent. If I look at the pro-Democrat headline here, which says 85% of Americans approved of Biden's first speech before Congress, that's misaligned for me because it's promoting the other party. But if I see the pro-Republican headline, Biden warns if Americans uh, don't get COVID jabs, they might have to cancel July 4th, that's aligned. Okay, For Republicans, pro-Democrat is misaligned, pro-Republican is aligned. For Democrat respondents, pro-Democrat is aligned, pro-Republican is misaligned. All right, and we randomize the order, whether they see the aligned or misaligned headline first. The outcomes we're interested in are this removal, harm, and censorship. So removal, we ask, how do you think, so we show them the headline, we say it's been rated as false by third party fact checkers. Oh, sorry, I should say that the treatments, these headlines, we have a bank of 18 of these, nine are pro-Republican, nine are pro-Democrat. We selected them from a fact checking site and these headlines were rated as completely false, so not par partially false, so completely false that were circulating at the time in which the survey was fielded. We also did pretesting of uh, candidate headlines to make sure that the direction of alignment was what we expected and to make sure the headlines were balanced on other characteristics, such as intensity. So we didn't want all the pro-Republican headlines to be much more uh, negative than the pro-Democrat or much more violent than the pro-Democrat one. So we try to balance on these other characteristics. All right, so then we ask for our outcomes. Uh, do you think social media, the social media company should how, should, how do you think the social media company should handle this headline? And so for removal, they can say allow it to remain on the site or remove it. Then we ask, some social media platforms allow users to report content as harmful. If you had the option of anonymously reporting this content as harmful, would you click report as harmful content button for that headline? So this is just a yes or no. And then actually the censorship question comes right after the removal one. We say, uh, imagine that the social media platform removed this headline, would you use the word censorship to describe this action? Yes, no, or don't know. Uh, and as I mentioned, sometimes these outcomes are asked after accuracy perception and sometimes before. Okay. All right, so turning to the results. This uh, plot shows the coefficient estimate and confidence intervals from an OLS regression where we are interacting the respondent's partisanship with the alignment of the headline. So what we can see here is that Democrats are, and this is the outcome of intent to remove, Democrats are very likely to say that the headline should be removed. The coefficient estimate is 0.75. Republicans are much less likely. Then the interactions, the bottom two estimates, those are whether partisans are more or less likely to say that their aligned headline should be removed or not. 
And so you can see that Democrats are more, more likely to say that their aligned headlines should not be removed, whereas for Republicans, there is no change. They just don't really want removal. And so the difference between partisans is this preference gap, whereas this estimate where you have the interaction between partisanship and headline alignment is party promotion. Okay, so I'm gonna, sh this bar chart, whoops, shows this I think a little bit more clearly. So in the first panel of this bar chart, this is just the overall difference. Democrats much more likely to say uh, false headlines should be removed than Republicans. And then if we separate out between the misaligned and aligned, I should say the bars are just, if you average the misaligned and aligned, you get the overall, okay? So uh, the difference between uh, the blue and red bars, that's the preference gap. You can see the preference gap exists for aligned and misaligned headlines. Uh, and then the difference among the blue bars or the red bars between misaligned and aligned, that's party promotion. We don't see a difference there for the red bars, but we do for the blue bars. So that's why Democrats for aligned headlines are less likely to say content should be removed and Republicans, same across the board. Uh, one thing to note though is that the party promotion size is smaller than the preference gap. Okay. We see the same pattern when we look at intent to room, remove headline as harmful. So one thing just to note here is that all the estimates are lower. So in general, both people from both parties would rather remove, it seems, than report as harmful. But you see still this gap between Democrats and Republicans. And you still see this part of party promotion for Democrats where they're less likely to report as harmful headlines that are aligned. For perceptions of censorship, we don't see any party promotion. So that's kind of interesting where for neither Democrats nor Republicans is there a greater perception that this is censorship if the removed content is aligned with their partisanship. But instead, what we just see is that Republicans are quite likely to say that removal of misinformation is censorship, whereas Democrats are not very likely to say that that's censorship. Okay. All right, so in the design of the study, we tried to control for the fact gap by telling respondents that the headlines were rated as false by third party fact checkers. For those of you who study this area, you might already think that, hmm, is that really gonna work? And it didn't quite work because you can see from here, this is the accuracy perception of the headlines. So first, Republicans are more likely to think the headlines are accurate than Democrats and both Democrats and Republicans are more likely to believe that their aligned headline is, uh, is accurate. So that's the bottom two estimates are positive. That means for both Republicans and Democrats, if they see a line headline, they're more likely to say this, this headline is accurate. So this creates a problem for us, a problem of identification. It means that we cannot completely rule out the fact gap when it comes to our estimated size of party promotion and preference gap. Uh, so what we do is conduct three analyses, three tests, that if the results of these three tests are consistent, and hint they are, good for us, uh, it gives us some more confidence that party promotion and preference gap are in fact occurring, uh, and that the fact gap cannot explain the whole uh, of the difference between partisans when it comes to preferences for content removal. All right, so the first uh, analysis we do is only look at partisans, Republicans and Democrats, who agreed that the headlines were inaccurate. So this is people who were shown the headline and they all agreed this is not true. And you still see that Democrats are more likely to say the content should be re removed. So, uh, Republicans are less likely to want to remove uh, the misinformation headline even when they agree that the content is false. And you still see the party promotion among Democrats. So, they, uh, so Democrats, even for headlines they say are inaccurate, are less likely to want to remove that headline when it's aligned, uh, when it's pro-Democrat. And still you don't see that difference for Republicans. You will though notice, so this is the intent to remove outcome, that the 
party, uh, the party promotion is even smaller here. So it seems that the size of party promotion has potentially more to do, has something more to do with accuracy than the preference gap. Uh, we see the same thing when we look at the intent to report headlines as harmful. Again, the two effects persist. Preference gap is larger, and the party promotion gap is smaller relative to the whole uh, respondent pool when we look at the inaccurate subgroup. Okay, so then you might think, well, this is um, this analysis could have some problems because this we're there might be something different between Democrats who say the headline is inaccurate versus the overall pool of Democrats. Same with the Republicans. What we can say is that on observables like income, age, education, Republicans who say uh, these headlines are inaccurate and the overall respondents are not different on those observables and neither are Democrats. Okay, so that gives us a little bit more confidence, but there might be unobservables where the inaccurate subgroup differs from the overall pool. Uh, okay, so same, same pattern, sorry, for uh, censorship. The second thing we do, another concern with the inaccurate subgroup is that the gap in outcomes is driven by headlines where there's a large gap in perceived accuracy between Republicans and Democrats. So to address this, we look at what we call consensus headlines. These are headlines that both Republicans and Democrats think are inaccurate, and there's very little difference in the accuracy perception between Republicans and Democrats. So this plot is just showing you intent to remove headline. Each of the colors, so you still have the four estimates, right? Democrat, Republican, Democrat aligned, Republican aligned. Each of the colors represents a different number of consensus headlines from two to eight. When it's eight consensus headlines, the inaccuracy gap between Republicans and Democrats is about 0.5 on a four-point accuracy scale. When it's two consensus headlines, uh, which, is at the t which is at the top, uh, it's a, an accurate gap of 0 0.02 on a four-point scale. But across all of these, if we're going from two to eight headlines, the patterns remain the same. Democrats are much more likely to say that content should be removed, and you see, still see this a little bit of this party promotion among Democrats. So the results remain significant in the same direction as the overall. Okay, the last thing uh, we do is look at accuracy as a mediator. So here we want to, so usually when you do mediation analysis, you want to know whether a mediator uh, mediates the effect of the treatment on the outcome. Here we're using uh, mediation analysis a little differently because we are interested in the direct effect. So when you do mediation analysis, you have this ACME, the average causal mediation effect. That's, in this case, how much does alignment of headline influence intent to remove going through perceptions of accuracy. That's the ACME. And the, then you have the ADE, the average direct effect, which is how much does the alignment of the headline influence intent to remove not going through perceptions of accuracy. So what we care about is that the ADE is still there after we have this mediator of accuracy. And what you can see here is that for intent to remove headline, the ADE is no longer significant, but for intent to report headline as harmful, ADE is still significant. So what this suggests to us, along with the previous two analyses, is that the accuracy perception has something to do with party promotion for Democrats. So we see that Demo party promotion among Democrats, but some of that, and maybe all of that, is explained by perceptions of accuracy. For Democrats. All right, so for everyone who uh, has encountered mediation analysis, you would know that there are really strong assumptions in, in play when you use it. So there's sequential ignorability, which is two ignorability conditions. The second one says that the mediator is ignorable if after controlling for the treatment and pretreatment uh, covariance. So in here, that's a really strong assumption because perception of accuracy, is that really um, completely separate from pretreatment covariance and the treatment? Uh, most people will probably say no. 
we are not randomizing the accuracy perception in the minds of Democrats and Republicans. They have an accuracy perception after they see the treatment. So the assumption likely doesn't hold. And so what we do is conduct uh, sensitivity analysis to look at would this conclusion still hold if there was confounding. Um, and so this is sensitive analysis where we have the sensitivity parameter rho on the x-axis. And so that's the amount of confounding between the mediator and the outcome. So bef between accuracy perception and intent to remove headline here and intent to report he uh, headline as harmful here. And what we can conclude from this is that unless there are really large deviations, uh, uh, large amounts of confounding, it's pretty likely that there is this mediation effect and the direct effect. So in other words, even if there is confounding between the mediator and the outcome, we still think that it's the case that there is some direct effect between the alignment of the headline and intent to report headline as harmful. Less so for intent to remove headline. All right, so to sum up, we find quite strong evidence for a preference gap, for this difference uh, in preferences between whether to remove content. So even when Republicans agree that headlines are false, they're half as likely as Democrats to say that the content should be removed, and more, uh, twice as likely as Democrats to say that if there is removal, that this is censorship. There is some evidence for Democrats' willingness to, uh, to use content moderation strategically for this party promotion, but as I mentioned, this is much smaller than the preference gap and uh, mediated by accuracy. And so for removal, it might go away after you control for accuracy. For reporting as harmful, it very, becomes very small. And both, and finally, both Democrats and Republicans are more likely to think that headlines that are aligned with their own position are true, which reflects this fact gap. I should say that for us in this paper, we're trying to disaggregate the preference gap and party promotion. We cannot size the fact gap relative to the other two because of our design. Uh, any size that we get for the fact gap would be a floor because we're already telling all our respondents that the headlines are false. So maybe in the future we would have a design where we can try to uh, measure all three in the same experiment to gather their relative sizes. Um, in terms of implications, should we look at this uh, optimistically or pessimistically? I would say that it's somewhat encouraging that the effects of party promotion are really dwarfed by that of the preference gap. In this age of affective polarization, I think we may assume that the strategic behavior is driving um, uh, some of what we see, but in this case, it doesn't seem to be the case, that there is this preference gap. And, uh, as to whether this preference gap is difficult to deal with or something that can be dealt with, I think then that really comes back to what I said when I introduced the preference gap, which is where does the preference gap come from? Is it deeply rooted in values, in which case it would be very difficult to, to, to bridge this gap, or is it rooted in something that's more changeable, like elite cues and signaling? Um, and uh, there is some evidence if we look at prior, compare our results to prior literature that it may be something more changeable. Because if you look at research that was done uh, 15 years ago, looking at similar um, partisanship and alignment and support for uh, free information, freedom of information, you actually see that there is more support among Democrats for preserving free speech than among Republicans. But that seems to have changed. So, there seems to be some changeability to, the pref to these preferences, which suggests maybe it's not only this deeply rooted, hard to, hard to change uh, impetus. But at the end of the day, for us in doing this research, the takeaway that uh, I would love to have um, to convey is that we cannot solve the disagreement between Democrats and Republicans by only trying to address what is true and false. Even if there's no disagreement over what is true and false, there will still be disagreement among Democrats and Republicans over content moderation. So when we think about policies, what this research suggests is that we need to look beyond um, the fact gap. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Great, thank you so much, Jen. <clears throat> Fantastic work, always so carefully and rigorously done. Uh, really appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, for those of you that are online, uh, if you text your or send your messages in, Ben will send them magically to my phone. Um, and we'll take questions from in the audience here. I'll start with a, a moderator one. <clears throat> the, um, the difference between Democrats and Republicans for the preference gap is, is, so, is so big. Uh, but you're, the, the, what you just closed with about how there could be these changes over time are really intriguing. If you were to rerun this, say, in five-year increments, going back to that uh, study that you talked about in the 90s, could, could you imagine what would have changed, what, where the preference gap would, would change over time? Yeah, so I think the preference gap changed in 2015. <laughs> and this is based on an analysis we did of congressional speeches from uh, the 1800s to today. So we look at mentions and discussions of censorship in each Congress over time. And you see... Actually, throughout, since the 1800s, uh, divergences between Democrat and Republican elites in their discussion of censorship. So around World War I, there's a big divergence. After World War II, there's a big divergence. In the 1960s, there's a big divergence. So in the 1960s, Democratic elites were much like, more likely to talk about censorship, uh, less around media and more around uh, mobilization and protest. Mm. And starting in 2015 is when you see this big divergence between Democrat and Republican elites. So in 2015, you see a lot more Republican elites talking about censorship, at least based on these congressional speeches. So something happened uh, in 2015. We, we did much more uh, expensive, extensive content analysis pre-2015. And in the pre-2015 period, whenever Congress, congressional elites are talking about censorship, it's mostly about China and Chinese censorship, and then after 2015, they're talking about censorship in the U.S. Uh, Republican elites are talking about censorship in the U.S. And do you have any insights from the congressional conversation on what was what, what took place in 2015 that led to that? Uh, the uh, 2016 election campaign, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the 2016 campaign was driving congressional um, discussion kind of in real time. Yeah, yeah. There was more discussion of social media platforms, mm -hmm. of free speech, of censorship when it comes to these digital spaces. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty incredible. Okay, I just want to check with uh, folks uh, if they have questions. So, um, actually, just one more, and then we can ground it. One thing I just wanted to check on is uh, censorship. How did you convey that to the participants? Like, what is censorship? What was their understanding of it for what you're? We we didn't define it for them. No. So that's why in the, in the prompt we say, would this word censorship describe the action? Because uh, I think fundamentally there's different understandings of what constitutes censorship from any removal, mechan me mechanistically any removal, to something related to who the actor is, whether it's government versus private, the extent to which uh, removal has an effect on ideas in society that are circulating. So I think there's this wide range of definitions that exist in this country around censorship. So we purposefully did not define it. And so it absolutely might be the case that the gap in perception of censorship is because Democrats and Republicans understand that term differently. differently. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, um, Daphne. Um, this is super interesting. So I, I would be curious to know, and this is out of scope for you, but maybe you know something about it, um, whether the results might be different in terms of Democrats versus Republicans attitudes toward censorship if instead of this being about politically relevant facts, it were about some other culture war flashpoint question, you know, do people who have abortions suffer from more depression? What are the long-term effects of gender-affirming health care, et cetera, et cetera? Do you have any sense, does, has anyone worked on that, how that plays out along party lines? People have looked at, so we're only looking at misinformation, and others have been studying partisanship and content moderation in a broader class of content, um, uh, harmful content, hate speech, incivility, other forms of misinformation that's not political. And we consistently, there are these partisan differences. Most of those studies don't ask about whether this is perceived as censorship. And also, they're more narrowly focused on kind of media content, less around, uh, less broad, kind of this narrow conception of what is free speech. Uh, 
and what is censorship. Uh, not framing, for example, reproductive rights or collective action protests as free speech, really focusing very narrowly on it as media and as kind of media content. Great. <clears throat> we have one question online coming from Anna Gibson, another colleague in communication. Um, and she's curious why you think it might be changeable. You had mentioned the, the observations over time. But she asked, it feels like it could be based in normative ideas about free speech or something more like the third person effect. Uh, and I guess elite cues could, could operate on both of those. Yeah, it could. Um, I think I'm coming at this from, so, so I think it fundamentally comes down to how do we think people or Americans make political, think about politics and engage in political behavior. Uh, do we think that there's, or to what extent do we think there are bottom up factors that are more intrinsic that are shaping then the preferences? Or an alternative, which is maybe people are really not thinking much about politics, don't have these really deeply ingrained preferences or values, and their attention is just caught by different things, uh, and their expressed preferences reflect that much more superficial mm -hmm. outcome. So I think, you're, I, I think the preference gap and elite signaling could be doing a lot of different things um, because it, w at least in our conceptualization, it doesn't have to do with some sort of internalization. But I think the level at which that occurs is something that more research needs to be done to figure out and disaggregate what is happening. Right. I mean, <clears throat> if we think about this, a large majority of the Republican-leaning folks in your sample, like, don't remove that. I'm wondering what the, thanks, Ben. Uh, what the policy implications would be if you were able to pull those folks. Like, if people are really concerned about misinformation, and that seems to be a concern shared by Republicans and Democrats, what would the policy recommendations be if one party's um, concern is don't remove that and the other's is get rid of that? Like, where do we land on that? And, and what, would, what would say, for example, conservative want if there were, there's a lot of misinformation out there? Would it be better? digital literacy because it's on individuals to be able to deal with this problem or is there some other mechanism that I'm not thinking of that would be useful? Yeah, I think, so So the thing with um, removing misinformation is that it entails a trade-off between right. potentially different, I don't know what to call them, potentially values. Mm -hmm. So if Republicans care about misinformation but they don't want to remove it, why is that? Is that because of fear that it's gonna be a sort of slippery slope that's particularly biased against conservatives? Is it because the value of speech is so important uh, and more so than potential for harm? So I, I think having that conversation to really flesh out what is this trade-off? Why, why not remove is really important because it's not clear right now if it's the case that Republicans care about misinformation and see it as a problem, but yeah, also don't want removal, how, that's a trade-off that has to be made. And so right. what are the values or the costs and benefits of that trade-off? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, sorry, Nate, go ahead. Go ahead, and then we'll, uh, we'll move around. Just quickly, there. and it, part of, um, uh, Daphne sort of asked my question, and I think, you know, as if you look at the other First Amendment surveys, uh, which look at things like flag burning, um, you know, firing someone who kneels uh, with, during the national anthem, or banning books, right? You'll get you'll get some different results. But I think that the kind of all other things being equal, point that you're making at this day and age is is right, which is that Republicans are, are see the main uh, challenges to free speech as coming from woke institutions that would would uh, censor them, um, but. But I'm wondering here how much of it is also a reaction to the social media companies, right? So, so some of, this is a question about censorship by California companies, let's say. Um, uh, and whether if, if government were the agent in this and different people were in charge of government, right, maybe there would be different results. Similarly, 
I assume this was this was done before Elon Musk took Twitter. And so, if you think about diff, you know, who, do they try? Is it about just censorship writ large, or is it about particular institutions that they think have a track record of anti-conservative bias? Yeah, we unfortunately cannot disaggregate that. In our experiment, I think the headlines looked most Facebook-like. So there's no logos, but it probably made respondents think that this may be on a you know California-based social media company. So, but so we can't really differentiate that. But I think that the, there's this question of to what extent are do we see this result because Republicans feel that current moderation policies, content policies, are biased against them. I think that goes back to perceptions of misinformation. And because if, so there's been a lot of research that so shows there's asymmetry in the amount of misinformation that's targeting conservatives versus liberals. There's a lot more misinformation targeting um, conservatives. So, but, but if conservatives really object to misinformation and see it as harmful and that harm overriding considerations about free speech, then if companies were removing, were doing more to remove that content, it would be good, right? Because the companies are working harder. More of their resources are being devoted to removing content that's harmful to me. But that's not the framing. It's rather that they're actually harming me, not that they're doing more work on my behalf. And so I think there's still something that, uh, that kind of bias, that perception of bias, I think masks potentially a lot of different things that are going on. It could be related to fat gap. It could be related to different differences in preferences. It could be related to something more strategic. So I think, uh, what, yeah, that bias could definitely be influencing what we observe, but I think it's really important to try to figure out why do we have bi that bias? Because if misinformation, if, if you know, I'm someone who really doesn't like misinformation and I see a company removing a ton of misinformation that's targeting me, I would think that's great for me. But that's not the case, and maybe a large part of it is because I don't believe that's misinformation. I think it's just biased. Or it could be something else that's going on. Great. Thank you. I was just uh, wondering, I suppose you presented those articles as online content to, to people. And I was wondering whether the perceptions would be any different if this was classical print media that you present to them. Uh, so you alluded in the end towards you know change preferences 30 years ago. So to what extent do you think that might be attributable to our maybe, I don't know, lack of trust in uh, the swiftness of online media and uh, uh, so, so to what extent do you think have perceptions changed over time then as well? Yeah, I don't know if, if, if in you know, today's world we would have seen a difference if we had uh, used print or traditional broadcast media as opposed to social media. Uh, and I think this gets to kind of Nate and Daphne's questions around this perception of bias, conservative bias. What, after doing this project, I think what it's really... Uh, raised is there's needs to be a lot could be a lot more experiments and research designs to flesh out these different components. Uh, for example, doing this same experiment in a country where there's either objectively or perceptions of more left uh, censorship, censorship of left parties as opposed to right, would we still what what patterns would we see? Um, as well as repeating this over time and changing kind of the content from misinformation, political misinformation, to other forms of misinformation, to other sorts of content, uh, as well as this context, so that we can isolate these various factors. Great, thanks. Well, we're getting over there. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I always worry about is when people think about misinformation, it's this sort of general abstract topic thing that's very you know, ambiguous. And one of the strengths of your design is you showed them specific content and then they had to make a judgment about that content, whether it was accurate or not. And when, when you take that into account, you still see the effect. What happens when you move out of the political space, do you think? And you were to show both Democrats and Republicans say something that was um, maybe health related, nothing to do with COVID, but something that's not polarized, say a ca cancer misinformation or something like that. Do you think you would see the same uh, preference gap if it wasn't political? What's not political? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, there, there, there is a lot of really great research, um, new research on content moderation, and uh, a recent PNAS piece where they looked at more broad classes of misinformation. I remember one of the kind of prompts they had was about uh, Holocaust. So Holocaust denial, do you remove that content or not? And they find a huge gap by partisanship over whether con a Holocaust denial content should be removed. Um, and actually they say that this is, can, that big gap cannot be explained by differences in whether people believed Holocaust occurred or not. Mm -hmm. So you, that's a, maybe that, that's political, but it, it suggests in a different context, something other than just disagreement over facts is still driving this partisan disagreement over removal of content. Great, thanks, Jen. Okay. Oh, who has, yeah, there you Hi. go. Hi. Um, I was focusing on the information part of the concept of disinformation, and from the journalism perspective, I have a question. Content moderation is targeting the notion of what is truthful or what is accurate and not what is appropriate from a particular uh, political leaning generator of information. So how do you factor that in in your research? <clears throat> or can you or would you? Or is it possible? I don't know if I so I, I don't know if I fully understand what you're asking, but I think what you're saying is, uh, so I think I don't think we can answer your question from the current design that mm. we have, yeah. but I think potentially if we look at other classes of information, we may be able to separate out these factors. Um, could you say a little bit more about what you think is distinct? Like what are the distinct components? My main, my main query is about what is perceived and what is the truth and who determines what and where. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering the relationship that content moderators have to delivering information to us and how much power they, 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 they are honing as opposed to what, you know, the real description of, or real description, the description of facts that are occurring to all of us. Yeah, so I actually would say that, um, so without getting into deep philosophical debates about uh, epistemology, um, I actually think platforms are going beyond arbitrating what is true or false, because the terms of community guidelines are not just about misinformation, but about hate speech and civility and, and other areas that are about appropriateness, not just arbitrating kind of factual versus non-factual information. And I think the actually a lot of the difficulty for platforms when it comes to moderation policies is that there is not this necessarily clear distinction between what is true and false. So let's say there's someone who, a prominent individual who said something that was false. News outlets might report that this person said that this, con this content. So then is a news outlet repeating misinformation or are they reporting something that the public should know? That's gray. Uh, it's not, so, so I think, one, there's a lot of ambiguity, and two, platforms are going beyond just arbitrating fact versus fiction. Great, thank you. Over here. Hi, really enjoyed the research. Um, so my question is actually, if you were to replicate the study, but not about removal, but rather about ranking, whether you'd see much difference, because of course the platforms, generally speaking, do not remove mis misinformation only in specific circumstances, like if it could create uh, imminent violence or things like that, right? Uh, and the, the vast majority of content moderation around misinformation is actually in the ranking side rather than the removal side. So I'm just curious if you'd, if you'd expect a different result for that. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, we actually thought about t uh, adding that as an outcome, but we thought we need to simple, not have too many outcomes. It was striking to me the, the kind of lower support for just reporting than for removal. That removal seems to be this kind of default that people go to. So I'm not sure what we would observe for ranking. Uh, so one disclaimer that I didn't give earlier is that actually most of my research is not on the US. It's on authoritarian contexts where I study censorship. And in those contexts, uh, censorship typically backfires when it's visible. 
So the act of removing something, if people can perceive that, will draw more attention to the thing you're trying to censor. So censorship, when it's obvious, doesn't work. And it's more likely to work when it's hard to detect. And so downranking is harder to detect than just blatant removal. But in a democratic context where you're going to have people trying to discover downranking and these efforts to obscure censorship, you actually might, I, I could think that you could, would get a bigger backlash because that's layering on not just censorship, but some sort of obfuscation of censorship and kind of deception on top. Uh, so I could also see ranking having a, people having a stronger reaction to ranking because not only is it de facto removing the content from view, but also trying to obscure the fact that cens censorship is happening in the first place. Great. Uh, where are we next? Oh, there you are. And then uh, you can hand it over to Frank after you're done. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your research. I'm curious about a potential added layer, which um, might be about a shared identity. So adding a question that would remind people, what do you think? Do you think fairness is a value that all Americans should protect, regardless of party lines or party affiliation? And then asking them whether they would vote to remove things or not. Has that been done? Would you consider doing that? It hasn't been done that I know of. I might be mistaken. There might be working papers when it comes to content removal. But it has definitely been done in other contexts. And it, it has been, I think, experimental evidence has shown that it does reduce kind of partisan divides and polarization when you you remind people of these values that transcend uh, partisan divides. Thanks. Frank? Uh, so I want to build on something May suggested. There's a great actual experiment that you could do with Twitter because it seems to me pretty obvious that the reason conservatives you know, worry about censorship is they feel that the platform is biased against them. And now you've got the platform is actually switching from a total progressive bias to a total conservative bias. And Jen, let me just summarize, because I think the mic uh, has gone off. But with the natural experiment here, Twitter moving from more away from pro-progressive to pro-conservative, uh, Frank's asking, is there a possibility that we see a switch of the preference gap? Yeah, I think that's super interesting. And uh, it would be great to do this ex same experiment again now, uh, maybe with an oversample of Twitter users to see if there is a change. Although there might be other things that lead people to be Twitter users, so we'd have to try to figure out how we can control for that over time. But I think um, that's a that's a great idea. I also want to say, I mean, there is this proliferation of uh, right-leaning social media sites that kind of talk about lack of moderation and lack of uh, removal and lack of censorship. But most sites do have some form of removal, whether it's just removing spammers. Uh, so, it, I, I think this is a, it's just something I think interesting to keep an eye on, which is there is this gap between perceptions of censorship and what is actually implemented in practice. And so looking at how that gap changes between platforms, between uh, periods of time could also be something interesting. Yeah, and that, that, your, your point about spam actually gets back to what I was sort of thinking about, like if it wasn't political. But, you know, I remember in the late 90s, email almost became unusable because mm -hmm. there was so much spam. You'd look at it and there was just all whatever, Viagra, et cetera. And you could imagine communication channels becoming just unusable if there's so much mm -hmm. non-usable or... So th there might be a difference here between misinformation and something else, which is sort of like noise. And that if you don't remove any of that, it just becomes impossible to use. So we're getting some questions online, many of them starting with fantastic talk and paper about what are, what are some of the other kinds of solutions you could see that might be beyond removal. So if we see increasing generative AI just you know, gumming the works, um, if you can't just remove but you could do downranking, what would be the sort of 
option space if you were a, a platform in your view? As in, please solve the whole problem. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think platforms are already implementing a lot of solutions other than removal, um, kind of flagging, adding information to contextualize um, misinformation. I also just should say, and this is something you've shown in your research as well, is maybe there's actually an overemphasis on misinformation. Uh, objectively, there is inf misinformation that is circulated and potentially, potentially or but maybe not been consequential to political outcomes. But at the same time, most of the research shows that the people who are exposed to misinformation tends to be uh, kind of a relatively narrow segment of social media users. And for most people, you encounter very little right. misinformation and it's not going to sway you uh, one way or the other. So I think there's also this kind of consideration of reconsideration of our approach to misinformation and to what extent should our focus be on that versus other categories of content right. that may also have implications for um, social dynamics and political outcomes. Great, yeah, thanks, Jen. Is there another question in the room? Good reach and saturation, that's good. Um, so one last thing for me is, it's interesting, no, nobody in the room raised this, but like why do Democrats engage in this you know, sort of pro-party um, distinction where the Republicans are like holding strong on principle. Uh, so one explanation may be that Republicans are just really opposed to removing anything. So there's no space for party promotion because it's just the strong preferences. We can't have this. It's going to be a slippery slope. It's going to lead to very bad things. Whereas for Democrats, there isn't, this, there isn't this ceiling of opposition, and so that's why we observe this kind of differentiation um, when it comes to potentially more strategic behavior. Uh, but I think the analysis that we're doing, trying to get rid of this fat gap or accuracy perception, shows that this party promotion among Democrats does have something to do whether, with whether they think it's accurate or not. So that, that seems to be, that was one of my takeaways, is, for Republicans, when it comes to removal of online content, if it's false or if it's true, if they believe it's false, if they believe it's true, mostly it shouldn't be removed. But when it comes to Democrats, whether it should be whether it's it should be removed depends on whether more so on whether they think this misinformation is really accurate or is actually false. Um, but it, maybe there is still something beyond that that is strategic. Um, and so, but, but I think we, we need to do more to figure out where is that coming from for Democrats. But as to why we don't see it in Republicans, I, I think it's much more likely that it's this kind of ceiling effect. There's no room for differences for aligned and misaligned. It's just across the board opposition. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. I'd like to just conclude with asking you sort of a big level question. If we were to get you to, you know, put all your very carefully controlled studies and experiments away and look across them. And you had one message that you want to say, like here's where I believe sort of the state of social media is right now and something that needs to be done. Could you just give us a sense of, of what you see when you look across the field of evidence, something you'd want us at the Cyber Policy Center to be thinking about or looking forward to? Uh, I would say this is drawing more on my, so I just say one of the reasons why I did this project is, uh, I think because I do a lot of work on China, some on Russia, Saudi Arabia, mostly looking at censorship and repression, because of that research, in the past few years, I've gotten lots of requests from right-wing media to, for me to talk about whether um, US social media platforms are engaged in censorship. So because I work on political censorship in these authoritarian contexts, I get a lot of questions. And that's actually why I wanted to do, I was interested in doing this research around this difference in perceptions of what is or is not censorship. And that's really actually forced my thinking as well to consider what fundamentally is censorship. So I think something I would, I would, where my thinking is now is that we should reserve the term censorship for situations where removal is consequential for the information and knowledge that circulates in a society. 
And in a place like the United States, where there is media competition, where there is competition between media outlets, influencers, for people's attention, it's extremely difficult, even for a very powerful social media platform, to completely suppress an idea. Uh, if, and just citing Tamar Mitt's research, her, her upcoming book on misinformation, large platforms do not remove content consistently. So uh, when content is removed from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, it very likely those ideas will appear elsewhere. And that's in kind different from what a government can do. So in the context I mostly study in the Chinese government, they can remove ideas from public knowledge and consciousness by removing it from all social media platforms, from removing it from traditional media, from discussions in classrooms, from so that, and they can do this over time in a sustained manner. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the removal of knowledge from society. And in a context like the United States, I just really don't see that happening for issues that are important to some subsegment of the population. Yeah, thanks, Jen. You hadn't said the word government when you were talking about Western uh, countries. So, but you still think like there's the notion of censorship is about um, manipulation of information flow, but within the U.S. within a Western context, government is less important. There, I, I, I see what you're saying. Like government can do things in authoritarian regimes they can't here. But when you were talking about the West, you didn't mention government at all. I didn't, and that's because for the most part, the well, I should leave it to other legal scholars here who can say more about what the U.S. government or is or is not doing. But I actually think governments are deeply consequential. But in the United States, it's platforms that are taking these actions. And some, in some places, we're conflating these platforms with governments mm -hmm. because the platforms have such large reach and such deep reach. So I'm not saying we shouldn't think about platforms, but platforms are in kind different from what a government can do and the type of reach that a government can have uh, over various aspects of a person's life. So the Chinese government is not only regulating all of the social media platforms in China, it has control over the internet, over the internet backbone. It has control over education curriculum. It has control over all traditional media broadcasters. That level of uh, uh, influence is much more than any single social media platform can have. So I actually absolutely think that governments are deeply consequential, but the role of governments in democratic contexts is just fundamentally different than in authoritarian contexts, at least as we observe today. And for the most part in a country like the US, the actions that are taking place and removing content is happening at the platform level. Got it. Great. Thank you so much, Jen, everybody. Um, uh, thank you, Jen, and, um, for doing a great talk. Before we give her applause, let me make sure I remember my main task. So we're here in this room next week. We have Cecilia Kang and Shira Frankel will be um, here, and we'll be in this room. Very exciting and looking forward to that. Uh, please join me in thanking Jen and getting us to think about censorship and parties and misinformation in whole new ways. Thank you so much, Jen, for coming here. Thank you.